also an advisor uh, for uh, many space and future themed movies, TV shows, and computer games. And to add to an already impressive list of accomplishments, John is past honorary chairperson of the California Space Authority's Space Enterprise Advisory Council for the California Space Enterprise Strategic Plan. And in 2000 was awarded the Space Humanitarian Award by Buzz Aldrin and the United Societies in Space. Uh, John has professional and master's degrees in architecture from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. And he founded the Space Tourism Society in 1996. So his current focus is on promoting and developing the Space Experience Economy, or SEE, and the upcoming uh, annual Space Tourism Conference, which he co-founded, being held in LA, uh, all of which uh, he will be talking to us about today. So uh, welcome, John. Thank you, Paula. And I appreciate the opportunity to share some of these ideas with everybody. And I'm always interested in getting people's opinions and questions and involvement in what we're doing. Uh, also, we're getting a, a lot of need for young people to go into careers in space. So some of your grandkids or kids might find this very interesting, but you're also welcome to get directly involved yourselves. So um, Julia, why don't we start off with the presentation and I wanna leave plenty of room for questions and discussion. Great. All right. So uh, as Paula said, we have a big picture view of the space uh, industry, what we call the space experience economy. And that brings together three key areas that people experience space. Uh, next, please. OK, so these are so what I'm going to give you guys is a background of what's happening all this and then try to tie it together at the end of the discussion. So these are the three mediums that people actually experience space. Uh, and this is our now famous triangle of things. So this is real space flight, actually flying to low Earth orbit, uh, flying to the moon, going to the moon and so forth. And on one side is Earth-based space simulations and tours like National Space Museum, Space Camp, Science Centers, IMAX and so forth. And the other side is movies and TV and games. There's a real synergy between all three of these uh, mediums. And what's great about this is someone interested can go through a lifetime of ever increasingly real space experiences. Next slide, please. So this pyramid kind of shows those experience levels. And the nice thing is, like I say, someone as they become more affluent or more connected in the space world can have ever increasingly real space experiences. And to most people's surprise right now, over 280 million people per year, 280 million is pretty consistent around the world, visit space attractions, museums, science centers, and get these types of space experiences. That's over a quarter billion people per year. So you can start off by seeing a movie, reading a book, going to a science museum, having a zero gravity uh, aircraft flight, uh, some friends of ours are developing flights into the stratosphere with these beautiful balloons. You'll see that down line in the presentation. There are suborbital flights, which kicked off to the public last year, which as Paula said with Branson and Bezos. And then there's orbital and lunar flights. So again, as you go through life, you can have ever increasingly real space experiences. Now, why is this really going to be happening? And why is it happening now? Next slide, please. So the business community finds this really interesting. Trust me on this. The two richest men in the world right now, and rich by a lot of rich, uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, both independently started their own rocket design manufacturing operation companies. Two richest guys in the world. Why? They're passionate about space exploration and development and inspired by the potential of humanity moving outward into the solar system. And that's our destiny, outward into the solar system. So when the business world has seen these really smart, really rich guys and self-made multi-billionaires investing time and energy and reputation and risk in space ventures, they pay attention. They're really paying attention now. Next, please. 
And the major investment bankers and financial community is paying attention. They truly are. So Morgan Stanley is predicting our industry will be a trillion dollars by 2040. I have a couple of beer bets with friends. It's going to be more like 2030. So this industry is growing. It's growing rapidly. It's diversifying. And that diversification means people who are not aerospace engineers or scientists can be very involved in growing the space experience industry, whether they're designers or accountants or finance people or investors, they can be involved in this growing and really exciting and we believe important and interesting community. You can be a part of this. Next, please. Now this very complicated chart on purpose uh, shows that 2021 was this kickoff year, this renaissance, this golden period for space enterprise and space tourism. There were so many flights, pioneering efforts, everything was risk, but it all worked out amazingly well. There was even a film, parts of a film filmed on board the space station by our Russians. Uh, there's plans for lunar flybys, private enterprise lunar flybys in 2023. That's a trip around the moon and coming right back to Earth. But you'll see Earth from lunar distance, and you'll also see Earth rise as the Earth rises around the rim of the moon. Very important. So this is just happening event after event, mission after mission. There's things not even on this slide. And as usual, there are things that are quiet right now we can't talk about that are going to be pretty amazing themselves. So there's a lot going on and a lot of opportunity to be a part of this. Next, please. So just a quick overview of what's going on. Uh, of course, SpaceX has their Dragon capsule and they've been flying uh, numerous times to the International Space Station, bringing supplies and cargo. And now they're doing trips with people to and from the space station. There is now an official space line, like a cruise line, an airline. Boeing hopes, hopes this follow after that with Starliner, but access to space is growing and the cost is being reduced by reusable vehicles and capsules. Next. And we're always amazed and love SpaceX. I mean, you got to give Elon credit for a number of years ago flying his personal Tesla into Earth orbit and then that's now going out towards the moon. But they actually did this. They flew his car in the space. And that was really an amazing, exciting experience. Uh, and this is part of being part of this community. Sometimes these amazing experiences and things happen. And you are part of that. Next. Uh, Virgin Galactic is now selling more tickets and going to be doing more flights to suborbit. Our good friends at Space Perspective and major sponsors for our Space Tourism Conference created a whole new realm through which people can experience space. And that is in the stratosphere through these high level balloon flights in this beautiful gondola uh, that will be launching in about two to three years. Uh, it's very soft, three hours up into the stratosphere, a few hours there, a couple hours coming down. So uh, no change in gravity, no G forces, a luxury cabin, they have a bar on board, a bathroom on board, huge windows. They're focused specifically on the quality and uniqueness of the space experience. They've raised now over $50 million. Like I say, money is flowing into this industry. Next. And Bezos has big plans, always has since high school, where he gave a talk about someday having a resort on the moon, and he's been building wealth and capabilities ever since then. And now at Blue Origin, he's graduating to larger rockets and his life goal is designing and develop, developing a resort on the moon and building infrastructure for humanity moving further outward in the solar system. At the bottom right of this slide, you see this landing vehicle with Bezos standing in front of it. It's twice the size of the Apollo uh, lunar landing module for a lot of reasons. Next. This was great. Uh, towards the end, uh, last quarter of 2021, the inspiration for orbital mission happened. This is amazing. This is the first time in history a wealthy private individual booked, like booking an airline or booking on a cruise line, a orbital space mission. They brought three friends along and they spent three days in Earth orbit inside a Dragon capsule, which is modified with this beautiful little dome structure 
on top of the, at the end of the nose cone. So they had wonderful views of Earth. Uh, they also used this space experience mission to raise over $200 million, they capped out at 260 for uh, St. Jude Children's Hospital. So we're beginning to see philanthropy and space enterprise kind of merging together with this is a wonderful uh, example. But this whole thing happened for the experience. Next, please. Our Japanese friends here, Meizawa, he actually flew with a friend to the International Space Station on a Russian rocket towards the end of 2021, spent 10 days aboard the International Space Station. Uh, and that was kind of a training mission for him because he plans to finance with Elon that lunar flyby mission I mentioned earlier, where this rocket capsule will go around the moon and come back. And it'll be the first time we've seen a live Earth rise in well over 50 years. All private enterprise, and he's taking eight of his good friends with him in a starship, Elon Starship, and probably four crew members. So this will be the largest uh, person to crew mission ever to date. That's really exciting, 2023 or 2024. Next. Now, there's the Earth-based part of all this, and all, all of the money and all the work is done on Earth to get to space. And right now, we have 27 spaceports around the world, uh, including this one, which is the first privately built, uh, not private, uh, purposely built spaceport, Spaceport America in New Mexico. So there are four more spaceports in development around the world right now. So these Earth-based space places are the gateway to the real space experience. And more and more of them are adding uh, space-themed education, conferencing, attractions, research facilities. So they're becoming hubs of this dynamic and amazing energy going into space. Next, please. Uh, at, here in Los Angeles, where I'm based, uh, we have the California Science Center and they have the Space Shuttle Endeavor. They're gonna be taking that shuttle and taking it, making it vertical, as you can see in this picture on the left bottom, with the big fuel tank and the side rocket boosters, those are all real from the space program. It'll be inside this tall building and you'll be able to see by going up these ramps, all areas of the space shuttle. So that's a quarter billion dollar project, which is funded and should open in about three years. And Disney, since it's opened almost in the 50s, has had space themed attractions. I remember as a kid going to one of the trip to the moon attractions at Disneyland and thinking I was going to the moon. And wow, that was got me excited about space and about designing stuff for space. They have a pavilion at their Epcot Center in Florida, which is called Mission Space. And to date, since 2003, just over 90 million visitors have gone through Mission Space Pavilion and had a quick trip to and back from Mars, 90 million. Uh, so, and there's new attractions and shows, Paul mentioned by Mars World, we're developing a proposed uh, $2 billion space themed entertainment, immersive attraction. We'll be able to visit a city of the future on Mars, and this is for Orlando and for Las Vegas. And if we succeed in financing that, we're gonna make those hubs of space experience, education, development, community building, and just showing an exciting and positive, and this is very important, particularly these days, positive, healthy view of the future, and space is an important part of that vision. Next. TV shows, movies, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here in LA. People are running around town with movie scripts and TV show scripts. We're involved in supporting these two TV shows, which are modeled after the Survivor TV series where contestants are brought in, they go through contests and the winner wins a big prize. The prize here for both of these different shows is an actual trip to the International Space Station for a 12 day visit. So these will premiere uh, later this year and next year and should get pretty good audiences. So, and there are other things like you said, movies and other TV shows and cool stuff going on. Uh, so the media industry entertainment industry is paying real attention. Uh, there are now two proposals that uh, credible groups who actually want to add a module, whole module, inflated module to the International Space Station or have a free-flying brand new small space station specifically designed and serviced 
as the first ever movie and TV studio in Earth orbit. This is real. It was science fiction even 10 years ago. Today, major studios and investment groups are wanting to do this. Uh, so that just totally widens the discussion, the variety, potential media, uh, all of these things happening. So it's a, like, it's a golden Renaissance era right now. Uh, next. This is one of my concepts and designs. I'm actually starting uh, the space uh, yachting industry modeled after ocean super and mega yacht industry. And to exist for the same reason, the super mega and mega yachts exist. Uh, not to make money, they're incredibly expensive to design and build and outfit and operate these ships on the water. They exist for social profit, not cash profit. That's pride and prestige and social standing and media and reward and other issues. Uh, the goal here is to migrate some of the most wealthiest people in the world and wealthiest corporations to have the space experience, what we call the overview effect, where you see Earth from space. You don't see any borders, any lines from countries. It's our planet, what's called Spaceship Earth. And this concept from the early 50s is that we are all astronauts actually on Spaceship Earth we need to take very good care of our spaceship. So this is, as a space architect, to me, a super fun thing to design and work on, but you'll have to have an extraordinary infrastructure in space to support numerous orbital uh, and racing yachts. You have to have yacht clubs. You're gonna to have to have the Space Guard Service, which is different from uh, the Space Force, modeled after the Coast Guard Service. <clears throat> And all this, again, is designed and done on Earth. The ships are packed up, brought into space, expanded, put together, and operated in Earth orbit. So this is an entirely new area of outer space yachting. And at our conference uh, in April, I'll be announcing the formation of the Outer Space Yachting Association, which should turn some heads in the space world and the financial world but that's what we want. We're in charge of doing dynamic, noble, great, big things that people go, wow, and some want to get involved with. Next. So uh, I love this quote and I've been trying to live my life by it. All of our organizations kind of are centered on this, that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that's very empowering and very exciting and something where you get extraordinary people coming together to do these bold, noble things and having a great time doing it and also making a lot of money doing it, which is really cool. So um, we're very uh, buoyant, excited about the future of space enterprise, space tourism. If we could have the last slide, please. So our next space tourism conference um, is gonna be April 28th here in Los Angeles. So one of the big hotels by LAX. And we're really celebrating this whole decade. We see 2020 to 2029 as the space enterprise decade where all of this has been bubbling for many, many years and it's starting to happen. Last year, things started flying. More things will be flying. More organizations will be involved, more investment, uh, more countries around the world will get involved and more people will be involved in the space experience industry. So this is a, a vibrant, wonderful time. This decade is going to be amazing for all this. And um, anybody who wants to come out to our conference or tell your friends, grandkids, uh, come out to the conference. It will be an annual event, always in Los Angeles and always at one of the large hotels by LAX. That way there's a consistency and I actually live nine miles away from LAX, so it's really easy to get there. Um, anyway, so that's the big picture. What I'd like to do now is just open this up for questions and get into a discussion about this. And I really, truly want to know what you guys think. I really do, because that helps us to improve what we're doing and gives us guidance. So you're now by a guidance group. What do you guys think? Well, thank you, John. Uh, how how fascinating. I mean, <clears throat> and your your conference date is, is a... Uh, historical date, isn't it? Uh, the April date. That, it is. Uh, and th thank you for mentioning that. April 28th <laughs> is uh, the date in 2001, where our friend Dennis Tito lifted off from Kazakhstan in a Russian rocket 
and Capsule uh, and paid $10 million, he wrote the check, to fly to the International Space Station for a seven-day trip on board the space station. He was our pioneer, our Christopher Columbus, you might say, the first person to pay to fly to space. Seven other people followed him between 2001 and 2009. We had a hiatus for a while when the shuttle was retired, but now we're back in business and going forth. But we always use April 28th for our space tourism industry uh, conferences, events, award shows. So there's a, an anniversary that we, we work on all the time. Yeah, and I, I was surprised uh, when I got looking at that, how how long ago that was. Uh, I think most of us are just recently being introduced to space tourism, but, you know, we've we've been at it for a little while, but now really in earnest. Um, so I, I guess my, I guess my, the obvious question I think most of us would probably be asking is, at some point, do you find, or do you care <laughs> that this will be something more affordable for people to do because clearly right now we're in the realm of the super rich that can uh, afford to be space tourists but where, where do you see us going with that great question uh i'll get to that in a second but to give that little history yeah it last year at our first space tourism conference we celebrated the 20th year anniversary of dennis's flight <laughs> and the 25th anniversary of the founding of the space tourism society and this year, believe it or not, is my 40th year working on space tourism, 4.0. I started while I was doing my master's program in architecture. So I've been doing this a long time. My wife tells me I'm some kind of weird time work, always 20, 30 years ahead. But after 20 or 30 years, people catch up. Uh, as to your question, it is one of the key questions. I get asked a lot from people, particularly young people, saying, I want to go to space. I dreamed about it. I'm not rich, I probably won't win a contest. What can I do, what can I do? And I just tell them, I have a career in space. And that's almost a magical moment for a lot of people. Their, their faces change a little bit, it's like a new horizon. And I say, there's all these jobs we're gonna need in space. Who's gonna cook the food? Who's gonna assemble ships? Who's gonna clean the space resorts? Who's gonna navigate the ships? Who's gonna maintain them? There are gonna be numerous jobs for people to actually work in space. And that brightens this whole horizon and opportunity for a lot of people to say, wow, I can actually have a career in space. I, I never thought about that. I, I want to know more. I'm going to, this is what I dream of and what I want to do. And that passion helps move the industry forward. Mm -hmm. So I, my answer is work in space. <laughs> Remember all the people who are on these yachts, they, the rich people, the owner and all that, but then there's the crew Right. And when the owner's not around, they really part, don't tell everybody, they really party on the yachts and have yeah. great all the time, sometimes take them around, you know, it's like, a, you know, it's running the engines, but they're really cruising. So there is a lot of opportunity to be involved, but being part of this growing, diversifying community with the quest for a better future for all humankind is a very beautiful way to live your life and to be part of that. All right, well, let me, let's open it up. We've got a few hands raised here. Uh, I think the first hand is uh, Richard Petway. Go ahead. Yes, thank you for uh, uh, opening an adventure. Uh, but it seems like a lot of adventures are dealing with the space um, uh, visit to the space station. Now, right now we have uh, Russian rockets uh, going back and forth to deliver goods to that particular uh, unit. But uh, with the Russian, uh, Putin and others uh, causing conflict, uh, we have an American strand possibly stranded because the Russians are not uh, willing to let him have a spot back to the United States. So the United States, uh, either through Musk or others, has to solve this problem, or you've got a problem that the space station has been politicized completely by uh, Putin, and therefore your major lure of going to the space station is not gonna be available, uh, at least in the near future. Uh, could you comment on such, please? It's a real question, a real issue. Um... It's really interesting, this morning in LA Times newspaper, there's a, a little discussion that the head of the Russian space program 
uh, got mad at the Americans because of all this stuff happening with Russia and Ukraine and so forth and said, uh, we're not going to fly you guys. You can fly to space on your broomstick, literally said that. And the response from Elon Musk group was, well, we're going to be launching a lot of uh, broomsticks for freedom. And Musk can double up at any time trips to and from the space. The Dragon capsule is proven. Uh, we can go and come to the space station almost at will. Uh, will cost a little bit more money. But if there's a real issue, and the big picture is a big problem, is we're real partners with the space with the Russians on the space station. They own a good part of it. And if they tell us to go take a hike and want to take their, their space station modules and go home, we have our space station modules, the majority of the space station, and we can refill up some of those modules with other things. So this is a cantankerous and difficult time. Um, and I don't know, most people don't know where it's going to go. But today, if the Russians do take their modules, say go home, we have our own rockets, and pretty soon Boeing should be doing that. Now, remember, Bezos is being prepared to get his next generation rocket uh, up and operating in capsules, which are actually orbital. So there's stuff going on, but uh, we're going to keep going. Now, there are four groups, all of which have hundreds of millions of dollars developing designs for their own space station, free flying or adding to adding modules, in fact, to the International Space Station. So there is a, a lot of umph right now on the US and allies side on how to maintain the space station to grow it and to add brand new space stations. But it's, it's really not good up there right now. Yeah. Barbara, go ahead. She needs to be unmuted. Yeah, OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, what I'm concerned with when you talk about the future and all the wonders that space travel can offer is uh, aren't you uh, butting up against the problems of climate change with all the flying you're doing here, there, and everywhere, both with planes and maybe with rockets? How does that affect our attempt to uh, deal with the CO2 emissions and other things that are going to be upon us, I think, way before you get the space uh, you know, tourism off to a big start? Uh, what has been done in connection with dealing with this particular problem? Well, Elon's Tesla company with the electric vehicles, which has really stimulated an entire industry, has done an extraordinary job of reducing carbon because of electric vehicles and now getting the trucks and all those kind of things. That's a little side thing from space. And rockets going really have almost nothing, a very, very little uh, issue on carbon and stuff. The space shuttle, when it was flying, was really, really a dirty vehicle. Those side rockets, those SRVs, they put a lot of pollution in the upper atmosphere. It was really kind of a bad thing. People didn't talk about too much. But the new rockets are much cleaner on purpose. And um, it's the core part of what's going on, besides NASA now shifting mostly towards uh, long-term big picture exploration, but also climate change satellites and what's happening with the upper atmosphere and measuring ocean currents with the satellites and all that kind of stuff. Um, you got to be inspired to push forward for a positive future, and space is one part of that. Dealing with climate change is a big issue. That's part of the idea of the yachts, with people going to space, having the overview effect, seeing how beautiful our planet is, and hopefully some of them, not all for sure, coming back saying, I do want to make this place a better place. So our, our answer to that is there's almost no pollution from the rockets. They're all becoming cleaner by a lot. Uh, Elon and other people doing electric is really helping with carbon. We're learning a whole bunch about the upper atmosphere and the big system and systems of systems on Earth from our satellites. And we want to inspire people to work hard to deal with all of the issues of Earth, climate change, equality, women's rights. I mean, all of those issues are really strong, important issues. And Bezos just donated another 200 to the second, so it's 400 million personally to all these different causes and stuff. Elon is quiet about it, but he's been donating a lot of money too. So the space industry is a part of the solution and an inspiring part of that. But that's a very good question. Thank you. Paula, let's go to John. He's waving his hand. He doesn't have a yellow hand up. 
Oh, okay. And Tom, Tom was also had his hand up as well, but who, John, John, go ahead. One. Just a quick, easy question. What is suborbital? Okay, great question. So imagine this is the Earth, my hand. A suborbital flight is you take off in one part, go into suborbit, and come right back. You do not do an entire orbit. So orbit is all around the planet. Suborbit is up, around, and down, and you don't do a complete orbit. All right, thank you. Uh, Tom? John, a great talk. I really enjoyed it and learned something. But I read an article, I believe it might have been either New York or New York Times, that uh, pointed out that it's been 50 years since we put a man on the moon and that the space shuttle project may have set us back in terms of manned space flight to the outer planets and things like that. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, again, good question. Um, there are paralleling space programs happening. For example, NASA in its, uh, in its uh, probe uh, program has actually visited now every single planet in our solar system. And we have two vehicles who have now officially left our solar system, Voyager 1 and 2. So in addition to the shuttle program, other research programs for aviation, there's been the uh, program exploring the planets and so on and so forth. That continues right now. For example, we have three active rovers on Mars, two U.S., one China. Uh, there's 15 satellites in Martian orbit. Uh, we are exploring our solar system. Now, the shuttle had almost nothing to do with that because all those probes that went out were launched by conventional rockets and so forth. I have been forever a very big proponent of the space shuttle program. And I worked on designing interiors for the shuttle and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but we learned so much how to do business in space, how to assemble things in space, how to operate for long periods of time in space. The space station has been up for over 20 years, continually occupied for the first time in history. Humans have been in space for over 20 years, all the different crews and so forth. So I think the shuttle program is very successful. Uh, the new approach of more commercial uh, federal government and private enterprise collaborating together, NASA pays you know, SpaceX a lot of money uh, to fly those cargo missions to the space station, now astronauts to the space station, also to bring back trash from the space station and experimental stuff and all kinds of things. So some people think we had a lull in the space industry. We didn't have a lull, we had an increase in, in diversity and things happening in exploration of the solar system, the media was just not as exciting as the danger of people going coming from the moon. Now, when we go back to the moon, more people, more diversity is going back, and we're developing plans to basically build, you know, habitats on the moon and basically be there from now on as well. Okay, uh, and I guess I had a, that was probably a good segue to my, my next question. So in talking about the space shuttle, I was, if I could do maybe, Julianne, can I do a quick screen share? Um, yep. And then I don't okay. know if you can see Phyllis has her hand up too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll be I'll be quick. So, okay, go ahead. Um, I was curious, John, if you knew. Um, and let me share my screen here. Uh, Orbital Assembly is planning their first space hotel. Um, let's see. Can you see this? <laughs> yep. Okay. And I saw you know all the little shuttles you know lining this thing. So. I think I was shocked when I saw that their plan to have this completed is 2027. What what do you think is the likelihood of that? Zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, they're good people and they're working on assembly construction techniques. Uh, but I think that's, I wouldn't even go near trying to develop a project like that. <laughs> and we're real space developer guys. Mm -hmm. So they they have a bold vision. Uh, it's could someday happen, but that's probably 20 years from now. And um, but you got to have bold vision, see what happens. Um, it, it, anyone who knows anything about the real world of space development knows we're going to do smaller stuff and learn and grow and smaller stuff and learn and grow. What they're proposing is kind of like, you know, the pilgrims coming to America and building the World Trade Center. Uh, don't think so. <laughs> okay. Phyllis? 
Um, thank you very much for a very informative talk. Um, I was completely unaware of this space yacht uh, notion, um, which is even more alarming to me than than Musk and so forth uh, with their ego-driven, what I see is ego-driven, uh, conspicuous consumption uh, because of their billions. I, the, the whole program I think is, a, is an appalling waste of resources, financial resources, technological research, resources, when we are faced with an existential threat from climate change, which is an issue that I've been studying for 30 years as a non-scientist. Um, thank you, Barbara, for bringing that topic up, but uh, it's just boggling my mind that these people uh, want to engage in their ego boosting in this way. Uh, we, we have so many needs to improve our infrastructure in this world, uh, and, and to deal with, with developing effective, uh, affordable energy sources on this planet. Thank you for letting me spout off. Okay. Um, how many tens of millions of dollars have you personally donated to climate change causes? I am not a wealthy person but I have spent thousands of hours of my life invested in that issue as well as other environmental issues. And that was my profession as well. well. Thank you for your service there. We think what we're doing with space and what we're doing with the technologies that are evolved from space and the inspiration from it are gonna be one of the leading edge things that help us with climate change. Remember, we know more about climate change than the dynamic, you probably know about this, from space and the satellites and monitoring stuff for decades. So there's a lot of people that hate space stuff. They don't want to be involved in it. You know, think we're bad people and we should be punished. We disagree. Well, I, I, I certainly do read a lot of space. I mean, we have five different science magazines in this house and, and I am very interested in space research, but not the kind of thing that's going on with, with the, uh, Musk and Bezos. So, so John, you do, could you tell us about the science programs they're both doing and supporting? No, because I haven't read anything about that in, in these science magazines or for that matter, the popular press, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, any of that. A no, little no. bit of it's a bit quiet, but there's a lot going on and we all share the same planet and we want it to be sustainable. And we think space is an important part of doing that. On the ego side, that's, you need strong, powerful, almost insane egos to do stuff like this. And that's been around for almost all of human history, people building castles, people building all kinds of different things because they wanted to and they wanted to show off and they had the ability to do it. So ego, when it's used wisely, can be of great benefit to a large number of people and to society in general. Uh, ego used with evil, like Putin right now, that's the opposite of what I see happening with our space billionaires. Yeah, and John, you know, I was thinking it might be useful to, you know, discuss a little bit, not necessarily here and now, but, uh, you know, at some point to, help with that issue um, to talk about what technologies um, space architects and space, the space sector has brought to the everyday person and the technologies we use here on earth. And, um, and when you're mentioning also about the large egos being necessary to move things forward, um, you know, we do think of people like Steve Jobs and, you know, just think about what we would all do without our computers and things of that nature that took those people with those visions. And a lot of times you can have visions, but if you don't have the money to further those visions, um, then you're, you're nowhere. So it is a delicate balance for sure. You know, it, it's very off-putting for a lot of folks. Um, at the same time, we can also embrace the technologies that we've learned 
uh, along the way and, and how those help us in our everyday lives. So, so that may be something to you know, discuss as well. You know, so okay. it's not just looking like a whole bunch of billionaires you know, playing with their toys out in space. Well, they're, they're really cool toys. They really are. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're having this conversation and sharing information and there's a super high probability this is being beamed up to a satellite and being back down, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that, that in itself is good. Little side note is something Elon's been doing for a while, which is pretty, he doesn't talk about too much, but uh, they're launching about two to 3,000 satellites, these really small sats that are in lower Earth orbit. And what they're going to be doing is bringing internet service to over a billion people around the world, a billion people who do not have internet service or have terrible internet service. This access to the world's information and to education and to a wider perspective of things is extraordinarily important to uplifting a billion people to have greater awareness, greater education, greater opportunity. It's very important for women because they lack a lot of education around these developing nations. If they have a phone, they can get an education and they can communicate and work together and do banking transitions that are safe and all kinds of odds. And ends. So besides the science, hardcore science, the space industry, space tourism, eventually space sports, you guys are gonna love that. Um, it's really getting the world more connected and that connectedness raises the standards of living the knowledge of people around the world and opportunity for a lot of people too. So there's a ton of benefits and uh, Velcro did not come from the space program and the astronauts hated tank. So just so you guys know that. Uh, <laughs> okay, I think we have uh, one more hand up, uh, Brigida. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for a very interesting talk. And I'm really glad that space exploration is talking up again. Uh, what I have a question about is uh, the possibility of damage from uh, the cosmic radiation for people working a uh, longer period in space. And how do you try to prevent that? And do you think it is a mystery? It's a great question and it's one of John, the big can issues. You repeat, can you repeat that yeah. question? Sure, what ha how are we dealing with uh, damaging cosmic radiation for long duration missions in space or long-term stays in space? It's a great question. And it's one of those areas that's a real challenge because the hard part about space isn't the technology, it's what we call the wetware. The wetware are people <laughs> and animals and seeds and all of those kind of things that are evolved within the shield of radiation here on Earth, but we're going out into an extraordinarily heavy radiation oriented place. So shielding uh, of the materials using water, which we need in space around the people when they're sleeping and so forth, where water is a very good radiation shield. Eventually uh, active force field shielding, putting magnetic fields around uh, space vehicles or space stations or space hotels. On the moon, it's easier because you can be underground and have three, three to six meters above you of soil, lunar soil, and you're pretty well protected from most of that stuff. But the hard part and the opportunity here, remember when it's a challenge, there's an opportunity, is how do we have people have safe careers in space? For the tourists going up or people for short times, it doesn't matter so much. They need to exercise a bit, but they'll come back no problems. People who go 20, 30 times and have a couple of years worth of time in space, they, the crew, have to be protected because of radiation problems and all that. Now, also, it turns out currently, mostly older people who've already had their kids are the ones going to space. Uh, so having some radiation problems with those guys, uh, to them, because they want to and they understand it, and we're dealing with those issues, is an acceptable risk and an acceptable issue. Um, and remember we had, you know, four, a lot of people go to the moon actually during Apollo and they were exposed to all kinds of radiation. There were some effects, but wasn't debilitating to any of them. And I know quite a, knew quite a few of the astronauts who flew the space, or flew and walked on the moon and so forth. But the science behind and the medical issues and the 
research on how to protect people and animals and seeds and fish and all those things is ongoing. And a lot of it's being done on the space station. The space station is a living laboratory. It's an international laboratory with 16 nations cooperating with it most of the time and really learning and discovering. It's pioneering stuff. There's a lot of questions we have. And the cool stuff is there's a ton of surprises. So surprises, as long as they don't kill you, are pretty interesting. But great question. Thank you. And, and John, on your upcoming conference, what, so what is your what is your goal for that annual conference? So who do you typically get there that attend? Uh, and what what do you what what do you get from that annually? Our goal is to create a welcoming environment for new people and corporations and even countries to come together and talk about space and how they might be a part of it, particularly on our forte, which is space tourism and space experience and space sports. It's a total hodgepodge. You have people from all over the place, from all, we have our billionaire friends coming, they're nice. Uh, we have all people who are just starting careers in engineering or architecture or filmmaking, a lot of filmmaking people. So we want to mix it up. We want people to just collide, to bump into each other, to start talking, to make friendships, and to learn about things they've never been exposed to in a friendly, nice place. And we plan to build this conference year after year after year into a bigger conference. So that triangle I showed you with those three mediums uh, next year, we'll have three days for the conference. And each day we'll focus on one of those particular mediums. And at the end of each day, we'll talk about it and we'll sum it all up at the end of the conference. We're also gonna be producing, maybe not this year, but next year for sure, um, a second event, which will be in November called the Space uh, Tourism Industry Summit. Cool. So everything we do starts with space tourism. Space Tourism Conference, Space Tourism Society, Space Tourism Media, Space Tourism. So if you don't see where, what we're involved with, we kind of don't want to talk to you type stuff. Um, but the summit will be an invitation, high level, very expensive event where people, CEOs and government officials, investment bankers come together and talk about how to enhance and diversify the financing so more ideas can get resources. And there's a lot of great ideas out there. And that we're gonna do future forecasting with futurists on where we see the industry five, 10, 20, 30 years in the future and so forth. So we'll have this leapfrog effect of having the general big picture conference in April, leapfrogging to the summit more specific on financing and future forecasting, then leapfrogging back to April. So that way, just as building a brand, our space tourism brand, space tourism society, space tourism conference, we get exposure year round. We also produce a series of webinars. If you go to our Space Tourism Conference website, we produce, if you're interested in it, eight webinars, each with a specific subject. They're all 45 minutes with the leading experts in those subjects on the webinar. So we're really diverse in what we're doing, but the core is the space experience and enhancing the creativity and ideas that will generate more quality space experience and just mixing it up. And also having good parties, and, you know. That. <laughs> of course. Well, thank you. I, I don't think I see any more hands up. So I uh, want to thank you, John, very much for your time with us here today. Very interesting, fun, informative, uh, and best of luck going forward with all your adventures and ventures. Um, and thank you again for, for uh, spending time with us. Um, everybody, I, we'll see you, next, see you next week. We're going to be talking about uh, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope mission um, by one of the project scientists uh, at NASA. So I hope everybody can tune in next week as well. And uh, thank you again, John. Appreciate it. Thank, thanks for the opportunity to share. Tell your grandkids and let's <laughs> stay in touch. I really do want to stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. John, Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. John, do you think you can share the link to the webinars in case anybody wants to look at uh, it's just on our it's on our website, okay. uh, which is www.spacetourismconferenceconf.com. Okay. If you go to that, there's a whole little section and they're live on our, our website so you can watch them for free. And uh, 
they're pretty good actually i watch it once in a while I'm like wow that's pretty good yeah, julianne i can send you that as well too okay so, all right okay. well thank all you right, so thank much you. thanks everyone bye-bye